I started writing to Roger Phillips five years ago, after we met at a mushroom hunt in Maine. Besides fungi, we soon discovered we shared two other obsessions, food and gardens. Roger is honorary garden manager of Eccleston Square in Pimlico, London, which he has restored to a gorgeousness enjoyed by all the residents, including his daughters, Phoebe and Amy, and his wife, Nikki. Roger grows vegetables on their balcony when he can spare time from creating garden plant books and writing to me. I got this funny and informative letter from Leslie Land, and I just had to reply. 3,000 miles west of Eccleston Square, on the coast of Maine, four hours drive north of Boston, Leslie has created a remarkable garden out of near wilderness. Despite freezing winters, perennials, annuals, and vegetables flourish under her care. Her partner, Bill, a willing undergardener, helps, so Leslie can get on with her work as food writer and magazine editor. Our gardens are separated by great climatic differences and the Atlantic Ocean, but our correspondence has made me realize that gardeners the world over share the same frustrations and delights. April the 20th, dear Leslie, back after 25 days in China and Japan, photographing gardens for my garden history book. I gather, and it shows, that spring in London has been cold, damp and wet. I've missed nothing, not even our wonderful Japanese cherry, Prunus Kanzan. It's normally over by now, but the cold weather has kept it going. At this time of year, Toddlers from our local Spanish nursery come into play at break time. They pull up the odd flower, but I love to see them having a good run around. My feeling is that we should try and get maximum use from the garden, but balancing that with the residents' wish for peace and quiet can be tricky. Our first open day is just a few days off. This year, I'm trying a new way of labeling things. My scheme is metal labels with the name etched in acid. I struggle. We have an organization in Britain, the National Council for the Conservation of Plants and Gardens. They try to preserve living specimens of all garden plants. I hold a collection of 50 Ceanothus, California lilac. They do wonderfully in London. At the moment, three are especially good. The first is Burtoniensis, which was discovered on the Burton Mesa, a hill near Santa Barbara in California. The second is Delight. It makes a 12-foot high shrub and never fails to delight us all from mid-April until the middle of May. The third is Puget Blue, named after Puget Sound in Washington State. competition with my photography. We were invaded by St. James School for their annual photograph. It looked horrific, but they were in and out in half an hour and left no mess, so no complaints. And I think I'll stick to flowers. Love, Roger. P.S. No school photograph enclosed. Just loads of shots of Chinese gardens. Dear Roger, thanks for your letter full of orientalia. Reading about Chinese garden theory is much more fun than weeding and trellis building. This is the best work time, actually. Right now, you can clearly see the shape of the beds. Both gardens are in the early stages of growth. I think the lower one should be better this year than last. The upper is, as usual, a bit ahead. Being on the hilltop, it dries out fast. Whatever was eating the tulips went away, so I'm having a pretty good display of the ivory Francoise against the purple of the Nepita Mussinii. The lovely Tulipa clusiana are not blooming through the foliage of the poppy bed as planned, 
because for the first time in a decade, most of the poppy foliage has failed to appear. The plum blossoms, on the other hand, are right on schedule. Their fragrance, combined with that of the wood smoke, is the perfume of early spring to me. It's time for the first of many trips to Camden. The harbor is a big tourist attraction, but I'm not in the sightseeing mode. It's a 40 minute drive north and I only go because my babies are at the old-fashioned nursery and greenhouse run by Irwin and Mary Ellen Ross. Mary Gardens is the only place I've ever found that rents out space to grow seedlings. In a climate like this, that's more precious than rubies. It's been a long while. Well, did you have a nice winter? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, as nice a winter as you can have when you're not in Maine. What about yourself? It's so cold. But we had did the snow have... cover all winter. And all winter? It, yes. And it, uh, oh, so all the plant, then. most plants lived wonderfully well. Boy, yeah. I don't know. I'm a little nervous well, about some of mine. How's your garden doing? <laughs> well, I, I took some damage this winter. I, I, I lost a peach tree. I'm pretty sure. I'm waiting. I go and look at it and sort of <laughs> oh. try to make encouraging noises, oh, well. but it doesn't. You know, I peaches. don't have any bug break net. Yeah. So. Peaches are not very hard to hear in me. <laughs> the Rosses have been at it more or less forever. Growing herbs, advising gardeners, I've been coming here 15 years and they never seem to change. My act hasn't changed much either, except that I now have Francie Stash to help start the necessary seedlings. About a thousand plants in all, onions, tomatoes, peppers, all the tender vegetables, delicate flowers, and difficult perennials. This year's group is looking good, with the notable exception of the blankety-blank delphiniums sink or swim on these delphiniums. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take this flat today. The alyssum is obviously ready to go and the parsley and the onions. So uh, I guess it doesn't make much of a dent, but <laughs> you've got to start somewhere. That's it. No more greenhouse. Time for the first kids to make it outdoors in the cold, cruel world. Love, Leslie. Great. Careful of the window. Okay. Ready? Dear yeah. Leslie, it's our charity yes, open day. One of the committee members, Lionel, does the work of ten, while Arthur spent weeks potting up cuttings, seedlings and bulbs ready for sale. And Beryl, who's also on the committee, organises the plant sales. It, it's, it's just about there, it's coming over, mind you not. Getting the plants priced and labelled is tiresome and time-consuming, but the children love to lend a hand. We had a bit of a struggle with the cable, but without electricity to make tea, no British Garden Day would be complete. Nicky has been badgering people to make biscuits and cakes for weeks. And then, just minutes before opening time, they finally arrived. We opened sharp at two o'clock. At a pound a head, entrance is dirt cheap. Sam and Amy ran the ticket sales, and all the money goes to the National Garden Scheme for their charities. I spent the whole afternoon running from peony to rose to iris, naming plants and answering queries. It does, it suckers like mad. Yes. And, we, we... and you can actually grow from the suckers? Yes, yes. yes. So, well, do you want one? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll, dig you, we'll dig you some up. It'll be Good, best. yes, it, we'd love some. We thought it was canary bird, yeah. but in fact, as it grows from seed and comes up absolutely true, I think you have to say it's just the wild rose, the wild Chinese rose, which is Rosa xanthina. <laughs> Are you having anything to bring? Yeah. Just cake. <laughs> Just a piece of cake. You're having tea as well? Oh, okay. These irises, are they related to the uh, uh, yellow flags, the bog marginals? I suppose they're related. Wild. But th these are not bog plants. These oh, right. are the big, big irises but that like they... it dry. Yes. The rhizom should be in a sort of hot area with the sun on them. But what happens is, after a while, they stop flowering because they start right. overgrowing each other. 
Right. And you've got to weed them out. So can you literally just, you know, put a spade in there and, and divide them up that crudely, or do you have to be careful where you cut them? Well... Because mine, since I divided them, they just they ha no definitely good. haven't done as well. They, uh, they tend to be no good the next year, quite honestly, but the second year they should be much better. Whilst I was trotting around the garden, trying to answer everybody's questions, my stomach kept interrupting with the question, where the hell's my cake? But I mustn't moan on. The real hard work is done by Nikki, Sally, and the task force of tea makers. Oh my God, Leslie, I forgot the washers up. Jim and Lionel again, of course. And a hot water crisis. I suppose without a crisis, it wouldn't really be an open day, wouldn't it? Mary Rose, that's a sort of sucker from underneath the tree. That's laburnum. Okay. Lovely. It doesn't really matter whether they're in the sun or shade, they'll both grow. Right? So, how much is that? That's two pounds. Sure, they gave it to and this one. Okay, and that'd be like that. Oh, that's a great big thing. Oh, that's beautiful. And of course, it's got a nameless line. This one is actually an ancient French lilac. Uh, they all used to be called French lilacs in the old days. And this is Duquesne lilac. It's one of the original French lilacs. Stunning flowers. By 6.30, the last visitor had gone. We then had to clear up and, most importantly, tot up the take. And there was 170 from the teas and 40, 45 from the children's ice cream and cake. What about the plants? 208 pounds. And does that include the 10 quid I gave you or that's not? That's right, yes, it includes so, everything. That's uh, everything. So what's oh, that, Lionel? 208 You lost it again. <laughs> 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 500. 700 just over seven, 708. 708. That's what you're saying. It's brilliant. Cushing, May 28th. Dear Roger, Lois, the world's best friend and neighbor, is back. She hasn't started painting yet. She always starts out by weeding the borders. And anyway, we're still getting our systems set up. Now that both of us are summer people, that's what comes first. I just went over for the annual changing of the cans in the composting outhouse. Compost loo to you. It takes two of us to pull out and set aside last year's full 50-gallon drum. Even though the contents are already well-aged, and a great deal lighter than when first deposited. There's no smell or anything, but it's still quite the adventure to get the stupid thing moved. Okay. No, we're doing good. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, no. Whoops. Hang on. There. Like the building is All right, don't go too far with that board. All right, you've got all the weight load here. After moving it, we let the compost age a full year more. I don't know why we bother. The stuff is almost pure peat moss already, and we're careful to keep it away from the vegetables. Well, better safe than sorry, I guess. Bill is hard at work on our new clay bread oven. Primitive technology at its best. Ovens like this have been in use for millennia, and they still work great. You start by building a stone base, then on that, you make a bent sapling frame. Bill used some of our endless, endless supply of alders, patiently wiring away while in a cloud of the most horrendous mosquitoes. Next, you cover it with a sheet. That makes the interior smoother than it would be if you put the clay right next to the alder frame. Then comes the real heavy work the foot-thick clay shell. Each mud and straw brick weighs about 40 pounds. You have to lift well over a ton before one of these babies gets made, and that's the least of it. Brick making is the real buster. I tried kneading that heavy stuff together and lasted about 10 minutes. Talk about aching biceps. Me for the helper roll. That's my speed. I didn't want to get off 
lot because the bugs are so foul down mm. by the hay. Do you want me to fluff this out for you? Well, that's kind of what you can do. I can do. Go along there. Of course, it's fairly buggy here. Boy, there are a lot of bugs here. Mm. <laughs> Bill the Good has also built a new garden arch using the bent alder technique he perfected while doing the oven. It's nifty. Got a nice big frame made from cedar fence posts. Once everything gets going, the white garden will be set off by a doorway of green vines. I've been planting beets and carrots in the raised beds. After years of work, the soil in them is absolutely stone free, so the roots grow straight. I take the time to plant a tiny two or three seed pinch at a time, spacing the pinches at the right growing distance. It's fiddly work, but it means there's almost no thinning required later. We found a great use for the rototiller. It makes clay softening easy, if noisy. I left Bill to it so I could prune the wild apple tree that shades my mother's ashes. I'm trying to keep the sweeping branch effect while letting in more light for flowers. Our ravine clearing of last winter has helped a lot. The whole area is much more open now. After pruning, tomato planting, always a red letter moment. I drive the stakes first so they don't hurt the roots. Okay, Roger. Here we go. First brandy wine into the ground. Let's hope we have a long, hot summer. I like to bury the first several inches of the tomato stem. It slows down initial growth a little, but the roots that form on the buried part make the plant much stronger, particularly if there's a serious dry spell. I have every hope that I'll be able to get some ripe fruit on my brandywine tomatoes before August when we go away on holiday. Leslie, my brandywines are doing fantastically. They're going to be as high as the house before they finish. <laughs> Yesterday, a busload of garden lovers arrived from New Zealand led by the journalist Maggie Barry. I showed them no mercy. They all had to crawl through the secret tunnels and tiny paths, whatever their age. Some people think of this as a tennis court. We think of it as a rose arbor, so yeah. we, we have a little conflict yeah. here. The bed at this end, that's facing south, and it's been planted with mainly yellow foliage plants and some yellow flowering plants. Not completely, but half the rows are yellow. This one here that's finishing really is May Gold. That's really yeah, of the cultivated roses, the first to come out. Luckily, the first rose that I was questioned about was Handel, bred by Sam McGreedy III, who now lives and works in New Zealand. It's a prize rose, repeating and repeating right through to December. This, which has a wonderful scent, is Guinea, 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 I suppose. Do people know that one? One of the best scented. No, it's Guinea. Oh. Mm. So, but uh, slightly smaller flowers, but terrific rose. What time of the year do you prune? Uh, we don't prune the climbers much at all. We tend to take a few old dead bits, um, and we don't basically cut them back at all. We just let them ramble. Uh, and we don't have many hybrid teas, so we don't do all that much rose pruning. We have a few hybrid teas, you know, we've got a few peas and things um, Queen Elizabeth dotted about. And those do get pruned, but um, not, not the climbers. Little is done to the climbers. I love tea roses. Rev d'Or is one of the best and most free flowering. It makes a large shrub or climber. But I also go for modern shrubs, like David Austin's English roses. Lillian Austin is my all-time favourite. All the small trees have got climbing roses running up through them, or more or less all the small trees. But apart from that, I actually like wild roses, 
and I like old roses. Uh, this is Fantin Latour after the French painter. And it's, it's wonderfully scented and that subtle sort of colour. Tomorrow, Dutch visitors. And next week, who knows? No tourist would be tempted to come see our roses. A few rugosas in the lilac hedge are about all we've got. Just as well. I can't bear having strangers in my garden. Pottering privately among the plants is my refuge and reward for working cooped up in an office. People think because I work at home, I don't work. You know how wrong that is. Oh, boy, am I ever glad you called. I was just thinking about you. I wanted, have you got a minute to go over this tomato thing? The telephone, Excellent. fax, and email are so definitely mixed blessings. I've been working on a major rhubarb story, using Lois's huge old plants for the raw material. I wish the oven were ready already. I'm currently hard at the pie aspect. And still on my dried cherries with rhubarb kick. I think I may be addicted to dried cherries. Do you get them over there? I use them more or less in place of raisins. In everything from pastry to pilau, they're great with things like oranges and rhubarb because they absorb so much liquid. Of course, rhubarb pie should be runny. I hate gummy pie. But I also hate soggy bottom crust, and the cherries help prevent that. It's finally warm enough, just barely, for the early blue perennials to start blooming. Painted Lady Iris and Cottonacci, I love the name Cupid's Dart, are doing well. Though the black pansies, oops, gotta go. The pie is ready, and Lois will be over any minute. Homemade bread. Oh, I like the shape of it here. I think it's like it's an igloo. Nice. All over. Oh, and the bottom here, it's yeah. it's uh, ten or twelve inches thick, and then at the top, it's it's five inches thick. Uh huh. And that's to hold. It's got something to do about balancing heat flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are ready. A we sacrifice are to ready. the oven. Mm -hmm. The. Hmm. Gods of pie will smile on it, and many pies will come to us. I figure it should be ready just about peach season. Oh, boy. Yeah, goodness. how many days now does this have to dry before you can... The French the wait pies? eight days. Eight days, and then you but start... They, and then they drink the wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then they drink the wine. I think, and then I think we'll probably season. wait. I think we'll, we'll wait a little longer, yeah. I think. <laughs> pie, okay. pie time. Pie time. Bill? Oh my. Yeah. To Bill for having created this wonderful. A toast to you in pie, your favorite <laughs> item. Oh well, I'll hey. tell you what. Here. Mmm, it's warm. Wonderful. It's good pie. The presentation of this program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS. The companion book to The 3000 Mile Garden is a collection of letters, drawings, and pictures exchanged between two gardeners. Leslie Land lives in Maine and New York, and Roger Phillips is based in London. Their transatlantic friendship is captured in letters that are full of insights on gardening, food, and the good life. To order your copy of The 3000 Mile Garden, call Video Finders at 1-800-343-4727 or write to Video Finders, 4401 Sunset Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90027.